really delighted to introduce uh, my good friend Paul Jensen, uh, who's going to give you this talk. Uh, Paul, um, I've known Paul for about 20 years, and uh, uh, he, he is currently a professor at the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine. He got his PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is part of UC San Diego, and his master's at San Diego State University, and before that, he did his Bachelor's of Science at Florida Institute of Technology. The really cool thing about Paul was that he grew up in Manhattan. <laughs> so, and that's by far the coolest thing. But the other really cool thing is that Paul had one of the most unusual trajectories as an academic of anyone I have ever met. He basically went to Scripps with a BS after having worked at Harbor Branch Oceanographic as a marine microbiologist and general field scientist. And he paired up with Bill Fenicle. Um, and the, between the two of them, he became indispensable to Bill Fenicle and essentially developed as a scientist uh, and then did his degrees there. Oh. Ultimately, he uh, was retained by SIO as a research scientist. And then Georgia Tech attempted to steal him away as a full professor, at which time SIO uh, made an offer that Paul couldn't refuse. And so now he's a full professor at, at SIO. And that's a, that's a pretty unusual uh, way to make it to, to that uh, situation. But he, he uh, is well regarded as a, a leader in marine microbiology, particularly as it applies to drug discovery. And uh, between him and, and Bill, they're among the few people that have actually taken discoveries all the way to the pharmaceutical end of things, to the, the point where they're potentially used as drugs. Because a lot of people do drug discovery or look for new molecules, but Paul, uh, uh, both alone and with Bill, have, have moved it all the way to the point where uh, they had startups and, and they got things uh, you know, in the pipeline. So. Uh, I know he's going to talk about that. <laughs> so with that, I'll Thank you, Joe. That was great. And thank you, Martin, um, for the introduction as well. And thank you all for coming. So it's really fun to be here and speak with you tonight. Um, I'm basically, I basically run a microbiology lab. And so I like to say that we work at the interface of marine microbiology and natural products chemistry. And so I'm going to talk a lot about natural products chemistry today. And some of you may know a lot about natural products already. Um, so some of this may be repetitive, but some of you may not know much. So I want to make sure everyone's on board. Okay? And I'm going to tell you about some work that I've been involved with over the years um, relating to finding new drugs from these things that we call marine natural products. Okay, so first, when we think about communicating, right, we generally think about speaking and, and oral communication and sound and listening. Um, and in fact, if we think about how organisms communicate in the ocean, we might say, well, sure, we know that some animals use verbal in the ocean, like whales and, and dolphins, okay? But in fact, the language of the ocean is not verbal, it's chemical. I can't hear anymore. <laughs>
Some of you may have flashbacks to some point in time when you were in school and you saw this periodic table of elements and your head started to hurt and, and <laughs> You didn't know about the karaoke. <laughs> I can do a mean Bob Dylan, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. Alright, we can calm down. Everything's settled down now. We're all we're all set. Okay. So we think back to this periodic table of elements. Maybe it scares us a little bit, but in fact, the chemistry of the ocean is not really about all of these different atoms that we see here. It's really about carbon-based atoms, okay? And so, um, if we think about carbon-based chemistry, this, what we're talking about is really organic chemistry, okay? And so, if we wanna, again, hurt our heads a little bit and think back, maybe in school, some of us got introduced to organic chemistry at some stage in time. Was this anyone's favorite class? <laughs> favorite class, wow, that's great, okay. It wasn't mine, I can tell you that. But, okay. So, organic chemistry is just a wonderful subject I can now appreciate. And we know that carbon atoms are joined together and appendaged in so many different ways to create an enormous amount of chemical diversity, okay? And it's this chemical diversity that really creates the, the alphabet from which this language in the ocean is written. I'm going to lower this. Okay, so we can take this another step because not all organic chemistry is from nature. So Scientists can go in the lab, synthetic organic chemists can pull things off the shelf and make organic molecules, okay? But what we're really talking about today is biochemistry. And so biochemistry is really the organic chemistry that occurs within living organisms, right? So, so these are the um, organic molecules, these biological molecules that we're going to focus on tonight. And if we think about biochemistry, we can again see something that hurts our heads. If we study biochemistry and we learn all these cycles in which um, organic molecules, for example, the foods that we eat, are broken down into smaller and smaller molecules to obtain energy. And also, those smaller molecules are used as building blocks for making our tissues and enzymes and those sorts of things, okay? And so, and so that was, that's the fundamentals of, of biochemistry, and, and those fundamentals are really similar across all forms of life on this planet, okay? And, and we call this primary metabolism, right? And so the language that I'm talking about in the ocean is not so much this primary metabolism, but it's what we call secondary metabolism, right? And secondary metabolism is really about building these molecules that we call natural products, right? And so this is what natural products chemists study. We study these molecules that are made, um, in this case in the ocean, by the plants and animals and microbes that live there. And so, what, this is the, the cover of the journal, and what they're showing you in this cover is that these are many, many different types of organic molecules that are made in nature, and the structures are enormously complex. And what they're trying to emphasize in this cover is that the building blocks, these little things up here, are stolen from primary metabolism, and instead of going into the normal processes that we use to make energy and to build um, enzymes and muscles and bones and all those things, those primary metabolites are, are funneled into this process of secondary metabolism. Okay, so we can take this whole concept and go to the ocean, and we can talk about marine natural products, right? And so these are the secondary metabolites that are produced by marine organisms. Okay, everyone with me now? 
So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. And so in general, when we talk about marine natural products, we, we, we think of their functions. When we know their functions, they're of an ecological nature. And I've listed some of the various types of functions that we know these molecules may have. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Okay, so um, these molecules play a really important role in mate recognition. Okay, and so how organisms in the ocean find each other when it's time to mate. And so one example I'll give you are with crabs. Okay, and so many crabs. Um, they only mate when the female um, has a soft shell. Okay, so you all know about soft shell crabs, right? And so, yeah, and so, and so, how does the male crab know when the female has a soft shell? Okay, well, the male crab knows that because the female emits a chemical in her urine that the male crab can sense, okay? So the male crab knows that it's time to mate with this female. And what the male crab does is he actually kind of kidnaps the female crab once he finds one with a soft shell, waits till it's soft enough, they mate, and then he guards the female until the female shell hardens enough that it can go back out um, and do its thing like normal. Okay? But it's even more complicated than that because uh, crabs tend to be cannibalistic. And so, and so the male crab is going, well, we could mate or I could just have dinner. <laughs> and so the female crab actually also emits in the urine another chemical molecule that suppresses the cannibalistic behavior of crabs. Okay. And so what this picture shows you is just how powerful these chemicals are. So this crab is holding a stone that was placed into a tank with a female soft-shell crab. Okay? And so if you then take the stone out of the tank with a female crab and put it in with a male crab, the male immediately starts to want to mate with that stone. Okay? <laughs> okay, so chemical cues are hugely important in mate recognition with crabs. I'll give you another example. Okay, so copepods. All right, so we all know about plankton, and we know phytoplankton are small unicellular algae that live in the ocean, and then zooplankton are <coughs> small animals that tend to eat the phytoplankton this is a very important part of the food chain. Okay? And so copepods are one member of the zooplankton community, very important members. Okay? But it's a big ocean and copepods are really small and they have to find each other. Right? And so how do they do that? Okay, so what I'm going to show you is a track of a female swimming and then you're going to see a track of a male swimming and watch what happens when the male encounters the female track. Okay? And so that's the female on the top and the male coming up on the bottom. And when the male encounters the female track, <laughs> boom, okay, takes off, speeds up swimming, and follows exactly where the female was to find it. Okay? And so I'm going to visualize this a little better for you. So now we're going to see a real live copepod. Okay? And so this white trace here, um, these, this is actually a scent of the pheromones produced by the female copepod. And on the bottom of the screen here is a male who's going to encounter um, that scent trail. And so it swims up. <laughs> okay, so it, it encounters it, it goes one way, it goes, oh, wrong way, boom. Okay, so so hugely powerful in mate recognition. Okay, and defense as well, okay? So marine natural products play a huge role in defense. And we tend to call this chemical defense, all right? And so some of you might be thinking, all right, I know some things that are probably chemical defended, and this may come to mind, okay? And so, can't think of a better chemical defense than what the skunk has developed. You also might think of things like this. And you say, okay, if I was in the forest and saw this frog, I would probably say to myself, 
I don't think I want to touch that frog. Okay, because it's bright red, it's like flashing a warning sign, like don't touch me, I'm toxic, right? Because in fact this is a toxic frog, and we call this a posmatic coloration when it's sending out a warning, okay? So these are examples of chemical defenses. So there are also chemical defenses in the microbial world, and this is one of my favorite examples. Some of you may know this example already, um, but this is about the leaf cutter ants and their symbionts, okay? So I think most people know that leaf cutter ants aren't collecting all these leaves so they can eat them later, right? They're collecting these leaves for a very specific purpose, and that's to feed them to their fungal gardens, right? So leaf cutter ants are, are exceptional gardeners, and they grow these cultures of fungi, which they later feed on. And as a microbiologist, I know how difficult it is in the lab to maintain a pure culture of anything, yet these ants seem to grow this pure fungal culture on these leaves. And how do they do that? Well, it's a little tricky because um, there are other fungi that want to come in and parasitize these gardens that they have. And in particular, there's one type of fungus that specializes on coming in and, and basically eating the other fungus that's there. And so, how do the ants get around this problem? Well, it's long been known that these ants have this powdery material um, around their heads and on their bodies. And it wasn't until about 20 years ago that people looked under the microscope and they realized that these were actually bacteria that were on the cuticle of the ants. And these bacteria produce a molecule, a natural product, a secondary metabolite, you can call it any of those names, and this molecule is actually a very potent antifungal agent, and it specifically targets this parasitic fungus that would attack their nets, okay? So these ants have a symbiosis with a microbe that produces a molecule that keeps their fungal gardens um, free from this parasite. So to me, that's just a mind-boggling example of a symbiosis and the role that natural products can play in these types of systems. Okay, but we're here to talk about uh, marine science, and of course there's marine chemical defense as well. And <clears throat> when we look at a coral reef, you know, we're always amazed because there's so many different types of organisms out there, and it's just such a amazing thing to see. And, but but why, why do we see what, the things that are there, you know, there's a reason we see them, okay? And, and the main reason we see the things on the reef that we do is because they're not being eaten. Okay? Okay. <laughs> and we know this because if you take a cage and cover part of the reef so that the predators can't get in, within two weeks, you would not recognize it, okay? It would look completely different. And, and that's because the things that are there are not being eaten, okay? And so we know that predation is one of the major drivers of community structure on coral reefs, okay? And so we know that, and so then the question becomes, you know, the organisms that we see, how are they avoiding being eaten, right? And so you're thinking in your heads, okay, I can probably come up with a couple of examples, and certainly one of them might be, right, a structural defense. And in fact, if you think about it, the things we like to eat from the ocean tend to have structural defenses, crabs and oysters and things that, uh, you know, are physically defended against predation, like this urchin. Uh, another example, we camouflage, right? So you might hide, and so that's a way to avoid predators. There are certain behaviors that, like schooling fish have, to try to avoid predators. But then there are all these things out on the reef that are soft and gooey, and you can just pick up with your fingers and just, you know, pick off the reef. You could squish them between your fingers sometimes. And there's absolutely no reason that something wouldn't come along and take a bite of that animal unless it was chemically defended, okay? <clears throat> and so, 
We know this in part through some wonderful work that's been done by a number of people, including our very own Joe Pollitt, who I've stolen some of these pictures from <laughs> over the years. And, and I've watched for years as Joe has determined and measured chemical defenses in different types of organisms, okay? And so the way we can do that is by collecting something like a sponge right here and grinding it up and extracting these organic molecules or natural products from it and putting it into a food source that fish we know will eat. And then you can feed pellets with the extract to the fish and see if they deter predation. Okay? And if the fish won't eat it, we can then separate those complex mixtures into all of their components and almost invariably you will find that either a molecule or a series of molecules in this very complex extract are what make that organism <coughs> taste bad. Okay? And so the reason these non-structurally defended organisms are not being eaten is because they're producing certain natural products that are defending them against predation. And we could do these things out on the reef as well, these same kinds of experiments, and you can narrow down to specific molecules. <clears throat> well, it's not just defense against predation, it's also defense against um, infection. Uh, there's a, a really nice example with shrimp where we know that they brood their embryos, <clears throat> We also know that, they're, that the shrimp are susceptible to infection by certain um, pathogenic fungi. And this is actually an appendage of a shrimp, and this is a fungus, a fungal hyphae, actually inside that appendage. So, so we know the adults can get infected by these fungi, um, but the embryos seem resistant, okay? And covering those embryos are bacteria, and this is, again, nature somehow um, maintaining what appears to be almost a monoculture of bacteria on these embryos. <coughs> and those bacteria are producing a molecule, isatin, which is a natural product, an organic molecule produced by the bacteria. And isatin has very potent antifungal activity against these pathogens that can infect the shrimp. Okay? So this is a, a chemical defense against infection. Okay, so that was a rather long introduction to marine natural products and chemical defense, but I wanted to share that with you because a lot of this information has guided efforts to discover drugs from the sea. Okay, and so <clears throat> knowing that there are all these plants and animals in the ocean that are making lots and lots of different chemical compounds. They're structurally complex. Many of them have potent biological activities. It only made sense that this could be a good place to look for new drugs. And in fact, starting back in the 1970s, people sort of connected these dots and a group of organic chemists around the world said, you know, people have studied plants, people have studied microbes from soil for decades, but no one's looked in the ocean to see what kinds of molecules we might find and what drug potential those molecules have. And so starting in the 70s, people began doing this in earnest, and this included either diving to collect things by hand or even using submersibles to collect things from deeper in the ocean. And this involved going all around the world. It's remarkable. People have traveled all over the world and sampled almost every ocean you can imagine in terms of collecting um, soft body plants and animals to study their natural products chemistry. And you end up with collections like this after a dive of different types of organisms and sponges that then all get um, extracted and tested to see if they have activities that might suggest they could be useful as, as medicines. And so there was really a, a golden age of marine natural products starting in, in, in the 1970s, when basically every 
thing that you picked up had new molecules in it because no one had ever studied them before. And so, believe it or not, I mean, people have done such a good job at this, in part because I think it's fun to go travel around and go diving in plenty, um, that it's really hard now to go someplace in the world and go diving and find a sponge that someone hasn't already studied. Okay? And so it's pretty remarkable how effective this has been done. And the results have been fruitful. And so there are a number of drugs now that are on the market. Does anyone, did anyone know that? Does anyone know that there are some marine-derived pharmaceuticals? People have heard that before? Okay, yeah. And so mostly in the area of cancer. This one's from an ascidian, a, a sea squirt. Um, this one's from a sponge. This one's from uh, a sea hare. And so this is a mollusk that's lost its shell, okay, because it's chemically defended, because it eats something that produces a toxin, a seaweed, that, and it accumulates those seaweed metabolites in its tissue such that the, the mollusk itself became defended and didn't need the shell any longer, so we got rid of the shell, okay? And so, so this is an interesting example, and, and, it, and if some of you are really on your game tonight, you're looking at that and you're saying, wait a minute, I see a structural defense, all right? So why are you telling me that this cone snail is making an interesting natural product? It shouldn't need to be chemically defended because it already has a physical defense, okay? But, in fact, there's a, a subtle but important difference of what's going on in this cone snail. And, in fact, the cone snail's um, not making a toxin per se, it's making a venom, okay? Because these cone snails hunt fish, and they shoot a harpoon into the fish and inject a, a neurotoxin that paralyzes the fish, and they engulf <coughs> the fish and it's an amazing thing, and those of you looking at me like you don't believe me and you think I'm crazy, I encourage you to look on YouTube and find some videos of cone snails eating fish because it's a, pretty, it's a pretty amazing thing. And so it turns out that that venom is actually has very potent activity um, because it, it, it blocks neurotransmission. It's a calcium channel blocker, um, and it's used to treat chronic pain. Okay, so there have been some successes in terms of um, finding drugs from the sea, but some of you also may think, well, you know, how, how do you deal with supply? You know, how do you get enough of these molecules if you have to harvest these animals from the ocean? And so one answer is synthetic chemistry, so you could potentially make the molecule in the lab, but in fact, a lot of these molecules are very complex structurally, okay? And even when some of the best synthetic chemi chemistry minds in the world try to build them in the lab, they're not able to do it. Or if they are able to do it, it's such a complex process and it takes so many steps that it's just not commercially viable, okay? So it can't be developed. And I can tell you for all these examples that have succeeded, there's 10 times that many that have failed because of supply issues. And so there's a real problem working with collected marine animals in terms of um, natural product drug discovery and development. And so that's where the microbiologists come in, okay? Because microbes, we can culture them in the lab. So we, in effect, have a renewable resource, right? So we can grow as much as we want, and in theory, we can make as much as we want. And so we know historically, microbes have been an important source of medicines. We all know about penicillin coming from a mold, right? So a lot of antibiotics, we've all taken an antibiotic, um, and uh, that everyone in this room has taken an antibiotic that's been derived from a microbe at some point in their life, okay? <clears throat> and so if we want to look at microbes in the ocean to ask if they make new natural products, um, what do we want to study? Where do, where do we even begin? Okay, well, first of all, we'd like to be able to culture them so we can work with them in the lab. And then we could go back and look at historically 
what's known about you know, what kinds of bacteria make antibiotics. And all this shows you is that um, of all the antibiotics ever discovered for microbes, about 16,000, about half of those come from one order of bacteria, um, known as the Actinomyces tales, also called Actinomyces is their common name. You all know about these bacteria because they're very common in soil. And when it rains and you get that earthy smell, yeah. that's a molecule called geosmin. It's a terpenoid that these bacteria make. Okay? And so we know they're abundant in soils. We know they make lots of natural products, including antibiotics. And so what we really wanted to know was, can we find these kinds of bacteria in the ocean? And we wanted to look in the sediments because it's sort of an obvious analogy to soils. <clears throat> and we want to know if we can find them, if they're different from the ones that we see on land. And if they're different, we want to know if they make new secondary metabolites or natural products. And so for many years, we've been going around collecting ocean sediments, either by doing that by hand, by diving, or using little grab samplers that we can get small amounts of sediment, or getting out on ships when we can to collect sediment cores. And we can use selective cultivation techniques, and sure enough, we can see lots of these actinomycin bacteria in these samples. So the next question is, are they different from the ones that are on land? And here, we can use sequence-based approaches, and so um, just like you want to know, you want to know what your dog is, right? And you're like, ah, oh, I think my dog is part poodle and part pit bull, and I don't know. So you can send your sample off to get some information about the you know, the family history of your dog, and so that family history is based on genetic sequence, right? And so we can take genetic sequences from bacteria and we can ask if they look like any other bacteria that we've seen before, and we can draw these funny little trees with it, and we can put red circles around the ones that no one seems to have seen before, which would suggest that, that these groups in the ocean are actually new. And so we've seen lots of these actinomyces in the ocean um, that appear to be new, and we've studied a couple of these groups, and I'm just going to tell you about one of them because they've been the, this is the one that we spent our most time on and, and it's been the most rewarding group. And so we were interested in this one because um, it required seawater for growth. And so one of the things we were interested in is, is, is there evidence that some of these actinomyces in the ocean have what we would call marine adaptations? Do they seem adapted to life in the ocean? And if they need seawater to grow, that would suggest they're adapted to life in the ocean. And so we showed that they appear to be a new genus, and we described them as such, and named three species that are shown there. And as far as bacteria go, I have to tell you, these are some of the most charismatic bacteria you're ever going to come up with. <laughs> Beautifully photogenic. <laughs> Okay, and so we've traveled around the world and we've sampled different places. Others have been involved in this. We keep our eye out uh, in the literature for when other people report this genus as well. And these are all the places that it's been reported from to date. And so um, they're color-coded by what species they are. And there's a couple stories here. I don't think I'm going to get involved with, with talking about that tonight. But you do notice that you don't see them from cold places, right? And um, we don't quite understand that. It's not that we haven't sampled, but we've tried, and we've never been able to culture them from, from um, we've tried more, more northern um, latitudes and have not been able to culture them. But at the end of the day, I'm perfectly happy that we can only find them from these <laughs> places. Okay, so for many years we've studied these bacteria as a source of secondary metabolites, and we found many, many molecules. I mean, they're, they're just a wealth of extraordinary chemical diversity. And Joe Pollack mentioned my colleague, William Fenicle, who's an organic chemist who I've collaborated with for many years on natural product discovery. And, and I have to give him a lot of credit for 
doing all the hard work with solving almost all of these structures in his laboratory. And so what we found was that when we add up all the molecules that we found over the years, more than half of them are new compounds. And so that would suggest to me that if we go to a poorly explored environment like ocean sediments and we find taxa that haven't been studied before, that there's a good chance that we're going to find some new molecules there. Okay, and in particular, I want to highlight one of these molecules, and this is kind of the C, the pharmacy part. Um, this molecule um, um, we found um, from um, one of the species, Swanospora tropica. Um, this is the structure, and it's, uh, you can see it's a very small molecule. Um, it's got a very unusual ring system, and in particular, um, this part of the molecule here is, is highly strained and unstable and reactive. And it turns out that um, this molecule is a very potent inhibitor of the proteasome. Okay, and so the proteasome is a structure in, in each of our cells. It's in effect, um, it's a, basically a garbage disposal for proteins, okay? And so proteins are used to regulate um, lots of things that go on in our physiology, right? <clears throat> and so enzymes, for example, are proteins, right? And, and there's a time when you want an enzyme to be around, and there's a time when you don't want it around any longer. And when it's time for it to go away, it gets tagged and targeted to the proteasome for degradation, okay? So, so proteasome is a very important structure, and it turns out that proteasome inhibition is now known to be a good um, target for chemotherapeutic agents. Okay, so we now know with the extraordinary detail how this molecule interacts with the active site in that garbage disposal system and it binds to it um, very strongly, it forms a covalent bond and it, and it rearranges itself and basically completely shuts down this cellular proteasome and that's made it a very potent anti-cancer agent. And so after a lot of work by a lot of people in a number of different companies, um, we now know that this molecule can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, you know, the original most um, proteasome, in, proteasome inhibitors um, are used uh, to treat multiple myeloma, and there's a couple of them on the market right now. <clears throat> and, and the people who were first developing this, and so I'll point out when, when we make a discovery at the university, um, um, the university will often patent that discovery and then a company will come and license that and develop it. Your development generally doesn't happen at, on the university campus. And so um, when this was originally licensed, the indication they were going after was for multiple myeloma. But when they recognized that the molecule was actually crossing the blood-brain barrier, um, they realized that this could potentially work for glioblastoma as well, and we all know that, that was a, that's a really tough one to deal with. And so Celgene um, has now taken this molecule into phase three <coughs> clinical trials, and so there's three phases of human clinical trials. Phase three is the last one, and if it passes this one, um, then, then we think we'll have the first ever marine microbial-derived drug. So very, very excited that that might happen. Even getting this far, you know, just for our field, like everyone in our field loves this story because when we write grant proposals to funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health, you know, it's really good if people are finding molecules from the ocean that are getting into clinical trials. So, okay. So, I'm going to spend just the last few minutes, I know I've been talking a lot, and maybe we're not running too late. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to take you a little bit into the future with this field, okay? And so, everything I've told you about so far in terms of microbial natural product discovery has been with what I would call tra a traditional paradigm, okay? We go out, we culture microbes from ocean sediments, in our case, we grow them in the lab, we extract them with organic solvents, and then we test those <coughs> extracts to see if they have an interesting activity, like can they kill cancer cells. 
And then if they can, then we use chromatography, which is a method to separate those complex extracts into all of their individual components, which we test individually back in this bioassay until you find an active molecule. Once you find the active molecule, you have to solve the structure. You have to hope the structure is new. And then if it is, then you're sort of off to the races to try and develop it. Okay? So, so this is the tried and true process, but it's a long process. It's a, it's a bit cumbersome. It's a lot of work. And you can, you can lead to a low discovery rate, especially if you're finding the same molecules over and over again. Okay, but now we're in the genomic era. Okay, so everyone's sequencing DNA, right? And so we can sequence the DNA of microbes really easily now, and we can look at their genomes, and we can ask questions based on what we see in their genomes about what kinds of molecules we think they might make, okay? And so when we first got into this game, which we call genome mining, okay, we used to manually have to go through the genome and find the genes that we think are gonna make these kinds of molecules and ask which ones we think are interesting. And when we find ones that we can predict might make something interesting, we can actually read these gene sequences almost like a book and make predictions about what the structures might look like without doing any chemistry, and then we can go after those molecules, okay? And so, and so we've done that, and, and in the beginning, it was a, a, a fairly burdensome process, um, but now, if we go back to this scheme, there are actually some, some bioinformatic tools that are available, <clears throat> and you can take your genome sequence and you can plug them into these tools, and it's gonna give you a lot of information about what kinds of molecules your microbe may make. And you can read that information and make predictions in many cases, like, well, this organism's probably gonna make a molecule that we already know about and we're not very interested in. Or another organism might make something that we think we've never seen before and we want to go after it. And then you can, you can go into this discovery, into this part, which can often be the hardest part, in a much more informed way, okay, as opposed to just randomly hoping we find something. Okay, so um, these, what we'll call these new approaches to natural product discovery or genome mining, um, this has been, this has revolutionized the way uh, people think about microbial natural product discovery. It's, it's completely changed the field. It's an enormously exciting time. Um, a lot of people have used this sequence information to then do what we call synthetic biology, okay? So you may say, oh, I see these genes in this strain of bacteria that look like they might make something interesting. I'm going to take them out and I'm going to put them into a strain that I can do genetics with and I'm going to make the molecules that way, okay? So we call this heterologous expression in the field of synthetic biology and that's been a, a popular approach to try to capitalize on some of the richness that we're seeing in all these genomes. You know, from our perspective, because we're more microbiology and ecology oriented, we really want to understand you know, what's getting these microbes to make them in nature, okay? They're often expensive to make um, in terms of the resources the microbes have to devote to making them. And so they don't necessarily want to make them all the time. And so it's pretty clear um, that there are often triggers, like it might be a competitor, right? If there are other microbes around, they may start making an antibiotic. So we're really interested in starting to understand what these natural cues are um, that trigger the production of these molecules. And what really fascinates me is that as we sequence more of these genomes, we can actually start to see how nature has evolved to generate new chemical diversity. And in this example I'm showing you here, um, we have two lineages of bacteria. We can show that the genes required to make a certain molecule, in this case, our favorite molecule, Selenosporomide A, was acquired back here. And then as these species diverged, 
Um, they ended up producing different versions of this molecule, and we can even see how the genes have changed in those two lineages to produce different versions of what, in effect, is the same um, molecular family we can call it. So, so it's really an exciting time to be studying marine natural products. Um, we can use the sequence-based approaches. Um, we've sequenced hundreds of genomes. We're sequencing hundreds more, and we keep learning more and more every time. Every time we, we, we look more deeply into these bacteria. Um, to try and understand um, how they're generating this incredible wealth of chemistry that's been so important to us in terms of finding um, pharmaceutical agents. And so I'm going to stop there by just saying, um, you know, just how incredibly privileged I feel to be at the University of California, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where we get the most amazing, brightest, young, enthusiastic students who come in and work incredibly hard and, and just love the science and, and certainly keep me on my toes all the time trying to keep up with these guys and all of their ideas. But it's really been a privilege to be able to work with such a fine group of people and have great collaborators there as well. And so if there's time, I would be happy to take a few questions. Yeah, so, so this is, continues to be a huge pro problem. Um, you know, a lot of the direction that the people who do marine natural products research go depends on funding. And the National Cancer Institute's been a huge supporter of marine natural products research, but the, the institutes that study antibiotics have not. And so it's been hard to get money to look for new antibiotics from marine sources. And, uh, and as a lot of you probably know, the pharmaceutical industry sort of dropped out of that game too. And so there is a huge problem with a pipeline for new antibiotics and a huge problem with developing resistance. And, and if I can just throw a little tangent from your question in that, you know, I think we were really naive um, um, assuming that you know, one set of antibiotics was going to work forever because we know that you know, microbes have been producing antibiotics and becoming resistant to them for millions and millions of years, long before we started using and overusing them. And so it's been a constant arms race that the microbes have been undergoing, making new chemistry, resistance develops, making new molecules, resistance develops, on and on, just like we see how new chemistry starts to evolve in, in our genomes. And so I think we were naive to just sit back and say, well, we have a couple of antibiotics that work and they're going to work forever. And so we really got behind the game and we have to use smarter strategies, I think, in using antibiotics and not always using the same ones over and over again um, to help avoid the spread of, of resistance. Such a good question. How did you know that? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I didn't bring this up, but it, you can also use what we call culture-independent methods, where we can just look for a DNA signal of these bacteria. And when we look in colder places, we can see their DNA signal, but we can't culture them. And so these bacteria also make spores. And so they can get distributed. It's not clear if the spores are still viable or recoverable, if that's what stage they're in. But this is a big mystery for us. But great question. Yeah. 
your protease inhibitor, do you have any idea why it crosses the blood-brain barrier? Um, I think just because it's so small. I mean, it, the molecular weight is 313. This is a very small molecule for a drug. So I, I would assume it's, it's mostly just based on the size. When you're dealing with uh, products that are coming out of some natural organism, how do you make this economically viable? Are you selling the information about where to look and find this? Or are you patenting a process? Or are you doing the work and selling the fact that we extracted this here and you can buy this product from us? What do you do with, with your discovery? Yeah, well, there's a lot of economic challenges to developing this kinds of research, for sure. Um, you know, at the university, you know, our mission is really to advance science, and so we're obliged as university employees to disclose anything we discover that we think has commercial potential commercial value. It's then up to the university to decide how that might get developed. And, and most universities have a technology transfer office that deals with those mm. things, okay? And so, yeah, so we're kind of the front line um, in the discovery process, and what we just like to hope is that, you know, if we find a molecule that has some interesting properties, that someone else is gonna figure out all these hard challenges that you're bringing up down the line. You know, and the university really encourages like little spin-off companies and these kinds of things, but, to get started, and then, then that creates jobs, and you know these are all good things to happen. In fact, I mean, you know, I don't know if anyone recognizes this, but but the, the whole biotechnology revolution started uh, when remember Senator Bob Dole, okay? It was the Bi Dole Amendment, and the Bi Dole Amendment allowed research that was discovered using federal <coughs> funds to be patented. It used to be the universities could not patent anything that was discovered on their campuses. Only the government could patent them. And the government almost never got around to doing that. And so the Bayh-Dole Amendment allowed university discoveries to be patented. And once they were patented, then they could be developed effectively. And that's what created all these little biotech companies around universities developing these technologies that were licensed from the university. Okay, so so that was a, a yeah, yeah. you know that was really insightful of those guys to recognize the importance of doing that. You mentioned early on that ninety percent of the interesting molecules are fail commercially because of lack of availability. It's hard to get them from distant sponges and so forth. The question is, is this problem solved by the gene splicing techniques and the synthetic uh, production in garden variety microbes? Uh, yeah, so the problem with the molecules that are coming from higher organisms is that it's really hard to find the genes that make them. Okay, we can do it in bacteria a lot more effectively because we know how to recognize them and they're usually all sitting right together in a nice little package. If you look at like a sea squirt and you try to find the genes that are making a certain type of molecule from that sea squirt, it's really hard to find them. If you could find them in theory, then you could try to take them out and you express them in E. coli or something and produce them that way. But um, it's, we've got a little ways to go before we can do that very effectively. Well, thank our speaker, Dr. Jackson. I have a little bit of a UNCW swag so you can advertise us. the door so time to probably ask more questions and time to mix and make them. <laughs>